Hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Gordon McNeely. This is the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, Wednesday, January 12, 2022, and our first uh, meeting of the year. So um, I uh, just want to say this is, will be a little bit... Uh, a little bit different. We're, we're, we have some people uh, here virtually and, and in the uh, chamber as well. So there's just a couple of uh, little things. We'll give it a little bit more time. Um, we're going to try to uh, make sure that everybody's heard and, and, um, and go from there. So in the chamber, we have um, uh, members with us. We have Zach Bell, uh, Sydney McEwen, Rob Henderson, and Michelle Beaton. And joining us virtually is uh, Carlo, Carlo Bernard. Um, uh, to as there as well. I'm not sure if, if Ola was is not not going to be with us today. Okay, uh, I thought he might be visiting. So um, uh, just to let the guests know that when you're when you're speaking, obviously your mics you you're, you can speak freely, but when you're not speaking, uh, virtually just uh, mute your mic if you can. Uh, the little mute button there. So um, at this time, uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda, uh, Zach Bell? Um, so perfect. So um, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Karen Cumberland and John Arelt here today uh, through, uh, through virtual uh, NIST today. Um, they're going to be giving us a presentation uh, on the role of the PEI Alliance for Mental Health and Wellbeing. So uh, welcome our guests. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll pass it over to you for your presentation, and then we might save, uh, save questions uh, to the end if that's okay. So welcome our guests, welcome our members, and uh, um, I'll pass it over to our presenters for uh, their presentation. Great, thank you very much. So just to give you a sense of how we're gonna approach this, I'm gonna run through the majority of the slides. John's gonna join me for a couple of the slides. And then we'll we'll open it up that uh, both of us will participate in the um, in the question and answer. So I'm just going to share my screen right now. Just give me a sec. Can you all see the presentation? Yes, Karen, we can. Thank. You. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I just want to thank John for joining us and, and actually note the fact that John is joining us from British Columbia today and it's 530 in the morning out there. So if I don't think anybody ever questions John's commitment to the community here in Prince Edward Island, but I think he's he's definitely earned earned some sort of a cup of coffee or something from me in the future today for for volunteering to join me. So thank you. So we'll just start with uh, slide one and and what I wanted to 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 do just to really set the set the stage and paint the picture today is take a look at the origins of the PEI Alliance for well-being and and the fact that the establishment of the Alliance is really a commitment to approach things differently that's been evolving on the island for for quite some time in the spring of 2021, the government of PEI announced uh, the intention to invest in this innovative not-for-profit entity aimed at enhancing mental well-being efforts for all islanders. Over the course of the early part of 2021, community leaders were engaged from across the island to help identify opportunities for better leveraging PEI's already existing rich and diverse array of assets into a robust whole of PEI approach to mental well-being that we'll walk through today. At the time, and, and, and communities continue to, to stress their priorities to us as, as we meet with them, um, you know, in, in, in meetings and, and in different, uh, different fora. But in the early days, they, they began to stress the need for better coordination across sectors, professional development of individuals working in mental well-being, and the importance in focusing on early upstream efforts to deliver better mental well-being outcomes for islanders. And as I mentioned, the alliance or the idea of the alliance didn't didn't come out of out of anywhere. Um, in the early days of, of 2016, the chief public health officer's report, Health for All Islanders, was published. I believe it was around 2018. Peter Bever, Bevan Baker um, announced motion 40 in the legislature 
again, focused on a health and all policies approach. And then more recently, again, the CPHO came out with their strategic plan with a focus of health for all Islanders. So this call to action from the community, legislators, and, and the recent financial investment of the government of PEI has created the mandate, role, and purpose of the alliance. And you'll often hear us refer to um, the symbol of a table when, when we speak about the mandate and the role of the alliance. And, and we really like to, to envision that the alliance is creating a table to action a health in all policies approach across Prince Edward Island. An approach that recognizes that all sectors and departments are responsible for meeting the common objective of promoting the health and well being of every Islander. So, when we think about a, a whole of, of island approach, why emphasize the enhancement of mental well being and resiliency? We work under the premise that resilience is a dynamic process that describes how we interact with the world around us to become our best selves. When we think about resilience, we shift our focus away from the things that cause mental illness and behavioral problems. Instead, we focus on how students and, and islanders of all ages can survive and thrive when they have the resources they need for success, even when they experience hardship and stress. The evidence around resiliency and the science of resiliency points to three key action areas to build resiliency. And those are supporting responsive relationships, strengthening core life skills, and reducing sources of toxic stress and its harmful buildup. Health systems are, most, are mostly designed to respond to the absence of health, and they rarely focus on building health and resiliency, nor do they build significant improvement to the health of the population overall. The Alliance for Mental Wellbeing is meant to, to put an emphasis on that overall population health. So that brings us to our role and, and, and really what the Alliance is, is mandated to do is to bring together the necessary ingredients to inform decision making on the island and in the end better target the island's rich resource investments. The Alliance understands that community involvement, collaboration, and accessible knowledge sharing are central to addressing health inequities and building a resilient public health system. The Alliance takes a whole of PEI approach in supporting communities in their population health efforts by providing stable and ongoing resources, supporting community self-determination, focusing on equitable engagement, building trust, co-developing processes and initiatives, and evaluating the nature and impacts of engagements and programs. The Alliance's knowledge sharing efforts bring accessible, high quality, research-based evidence on mental well-being and resilience to communities to support decision-making and continuous program implementation and improvements. And really the key, message is, the key message here is that by targeting the programs, policy, and underlying inequities that shape both the conditions of people's lives and their behaviors, the Alliance aims to build the resilience of all Islanders. So really, tangibly, how can we expect that the Alliance will change the field here on the island? The Alliance intends to provide leadership, and I, and I like to think we're, we're already beginning to provide coordination and communications related to mental well-being on the island by developing and disseminating with our partners a dy dynamic and pragmatic whole of PEI collaboration around a common vision. And we're working to build this by establishing relationships and cooperating with and among governments, the not-for-profit sector, the academic community, businesses, professional and voluntary organizations in matters related to mental well-being. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're also working to contribute to the effective understanding and knowledge mobilization around this common knowledge base that I referred to in those three action areas to inform mental well-being actions. We're working to facilitate and contribute to the development and application of professional development and capacity building on mental well-being. A little later in the presentation, I'll speak to the coaching um, service that we've established through our, our grant program that's in the field right now. We're working to promote and assist in the development of realistic and effective policies and programs aimed at improving mental well-being.
So we often hear the term upstream and downstream, and we strongly believe that in order to improve the health of islanders, it requires a combination of both these efforts. I just wanted to share this, this quote that I saw in the recent report from the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada and their state of public health in Canada. And it, it stated the, the pandemic showed that collective action across sectors is central to achieving optimal health for all Canadians and requires a public health focus on both upstream and downstream approaches. And, and we, we hear this term used by public health officials and the analogy of a river. And this analogy comes from a parable. Uh, a witness sees a person caught in a river current. The witness is able to pull the person from the river, saving them from drowning, only to be drawn to the rescue of more drowning people. After many have been rescued, the witness walks upstream to investigate why so many people have fallen in the river. Upstream interventions target the social and structural determinants of health, for example, stopping people from falling into the river in the first place, and this means targeting the policies and underlying inequities that shape both the conditions of people's lives and their behaviors. And because these factors influence many other risk factors, addressing them can impact a greater number of health outcomes at once. And this requires public health to provide data, analysis, and knowledge translation to inform and support upstream interventions, all the areas that, that the hope or that the alliance hopes to put an emphasis on. And this story, I just wanted to bring John in. Can I, I, I John has a wonderful sort of analogy related to this upstream downstream um, theme that we that underpins a lot of our work. And I, I just want to bring John in to share a little bit about that right now. Uh, thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you, committee, for having us this morning. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, I just finished up uh, uh, 18 years on the board of uh, Canadian Mental Health this fall as my uh, my last term ended, and uh, um, and then moved into uh, um, this work with the Alliance. I've been involved. I had been involved with other uh, NGOs when this uh, concept was. Uh, being explored and, you know, trying to grasp what, uh, what we were trying to do. And it really came together for me this fall with, with uh, two, two, uh, two incidents. Uh, first, I, I, I um, was able to take my assist training uh, this fall, applied suicide intervention training uh, through Canadian Mental Health. And uh, this, the same analogy, a similar analogy is used um, there uh, when we're talking about uh, intervention with suicide. Uh, where we have the river, but we also have the dam above the river, and we have a waterfall um, at the uh, towards the bottom of the river. Um, and obviously, you know, the waterfall is is uh, is uh, is what we are focusing on, keeping people from going over the waterfall with our assist training. Um, so I was intrigued by this upstream uh, approach, and it really came together for me when. So the upstream is above that dam. And when we were out doing our, our public information sessions, um, there was one evening in Western PEI uh, where we had a very small group. Um, and, this, and, and that's, you know, the intimate small groups are where you, where you really uh, get some traction. And uh, it, it, it really came together for me that night because, you know, we talked about the challenges uh, in the community that which, which there, which could relate to across Prince Edward Island. Um, but we also saw uh, the hope, uh, or heard the hope in people's voices, and we and we and we heard solutions and what they're doing in their communities, and it, it and they talked a lot about um, as as Karen described earlier, coordination and bringing people together and so on. So um, I'm very excited about this work, and I and I and I see the ability to harness all the good things that are that are happening on PEI uh, to have a community based led organization. Um, that really sits down and and uh, gets to the, the root of the of the issues and challenges that we have. So that's just a little bit of background about you know um, why I'm involved and uh, and and where I've really seen the uh, the light bulb, I guess, the light bulb moment uh, with with this. And uh, and and I often joke in, in in many of the meetings. You know, Karen has uh, I've had to rein her in because Karen has talked about. Uh, uh, having coffee with everybody and so right now i think her coffee list is up to about ten thousand people so 
Um, I don't know who's going to, which coffee shops are going to be the benefactor of that, but uh, it should uh, it should help the economy. Back to you, Karen. Great, thanks, John. Can can you all see the presentation again? Yes. Okay. So th this slide just emphasizes that we're taking a complementary approach towards upstream mental well-being and our, and our work focuses on mobilizing and promoting that common knowledge base that I referred to on resiliency while drawing on the collective strength of all PEI partners and assets to support and enhance the mental well-being of individuals, families and communities across the lifespan. So we wanted to take a moment and just just give you a sense of, of what we want to do more of um, in, in terms of that research-based evidence. But this is just, just a sampling of early ind indicators that demonstrate where we can make a difference for islanders. And, and I, I don't think it's um, you know, a shock to anybody that the, the COVID uh, pandemic has certainly had a massive impact on, on the mental health of islanders and Canadians, people, people across the globe. Here, um, we just pulled a, a little bit of analysis from some research out of Carleton where it said uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been described in psychological literature as a grim but illustrative anxiety-inducing stressor, an uncertain and, ungo and excuse me, ongoing threat that cannot be resolved via avoidance or escape. Research conducted as part of, as part of the PEI Wellbeing Project in 2021 by our colleague Connolly Aziz used quantitative data that highlighted the in inequality of mental well-being among marginalized populations, such as the LGBTQ community, gender diverse, indigenous community, and those living under the poverty line. These are the, the sorts of information and, and insight that, that inform the priorities that we'll be setting to guide the work of the Alliance in the years to come. And this research allowed for the impact of satis satisfaction with life, quality of life, and positive and negative emotions across populations to be measured, making it more likely for inequities to be addressed. We also have some emerging data from StatsCan and CMHA, most notably coming out of Ontario, that 43% of Ontarians are reporting experiences of stress, 53% experiencing anxiety and worry, and 28% experiencing depression. Although this obviously isn't of Islanders, um, it gives a strong indicator that attention towards mental well-being interventions is needed. In terms of the Alliance, given our nimble network and close connection to the community members and organizations, the Alliance is well positioned to inform public health policies, promote collaboration, and act as important on the ground mobilizers for public health interventions. And one of the most effective ways that we're going to be able to influence change is, is through our grant program, Improving Mental Wellbeing for All, uh, Focused Action for Positive Change, which was just announced in mid-December. So as we describe here, in support of our mandate, we will manage a $2 million annual grant program to enhance existing community-based initiative and create innovative solutions to help mental well-being outcomes for all Islanders. There's four streams currently in this inaugural uh, program. The first one got working towards enhancing support of current initiatives that are already underway on the island. The second stream is um, intended to support innovative ideas and, and innovation in general. The third strand, um, excuse me, the third stream, uh, the Creating Connections grant will support cross-sector connections. And here, we're really gonna be encouraging partners that potentially don't normally think about working together to look at how they can address um, well-being in their communities from a multi-sectoral approach. And then stream four, the targeted investment grants will support projects that will inform policies and system change, hopefully across the province. And these are um, 100K allocations of one-time funding. So as I mentioned, the grant program was launched in December. Applications will be due in mid-February 
and funding will be awarded by the end of March 2022. We've been working extremely hard to, uh, to get this out of the gates and we're really, really proud that this uh, program is, is in the field right now. Over 40 people and organizations joined our initial grant technical workshop in December. And this allowed the community to learn firsthand uh, of the grant program and that knowledge base. And we've left a considerable amount of information related to that knowledge base on the web uh, for potential applicants to access. And as I mentioned earlier, another um, initiative that we're extremely uh, proud of is the launching of our virtual grant, uh, excuse me, virtual coaching support, where prospective grant applicants receive one on one confidential coaching to help them prepare their submissions. We've had over actually 35 applicants register for the coaching sessions, which will take place between January and February. And there's absolutely no requirement for those people who take part in the coaching sessions um, to actually submit an application. This gets back to that call to action from the community for more professional development. We just hope that um, the experience of the coaching will um, help organizations better understand the knowledge base and, and potentially apply in the future, if not now, or, or use it to inform their day-to-day -day work right now. The applications for the grants will be reviewed by an independent community-based peer review committee. Uh, the public call for committee members was initiated on January 5th. We've taken a targeted approach and we've also done a whole of PEI approach over the web. And you'll see um, various uh, advertisements in the weeks to come in, in newspapers and on the radio as well to expand that, that call for members. And we're tracking towards future year cycles for the grant program uh, to run twice a year in the spring and in the winter. And the, the key point here is that the grant program aims to mobilize and empower local communities to take action in an upstream approach and meet immediate needs within populations. We're also excited just on that sort of collective action side of our, our work to, to see what kind of groups come forward and, and what kind of data and information we can gather collectively from, from the various uh, grant initiatives that take place in, in the months and years to come. So moving ahead, I just wanna give you a quick overview of the community uh, engagement that's taken place. And this gets at that whole concept of setting the table. John alluded to, uh, to one of the meetings that we had up west. To date, we had five community sessions in Kensington, Stratford, St. Peter's, and, and then a really well-attended virtual session to introduce ourselves. Unfortunately, our Lennox Island session ha um, is being rescheduled due to a storm, but we were able to target um, some information sharing with them directly after that so that they have got all kinds of information related to the grant program and the coaching opportunities. We've reached out to uh, over 200 community groups, Indigenous groups and organizations, and uh, we've also met directly with over 20 groups in, in a variety of fora. And I just want to give you sort of a tangible exa uh, example of some, some early partnerships that are already emerging out of, out of these initial engagements. When the potato wart crisis um, became a reality in late November, I reached out to the Department of um, Agriculture and Land to ask if there was any way that, that we could assist with enhancing the Farmers Talk program. And they said, well, actually, th there is something that you could do. We just don't have the time right now. And this is exactly where, where I can feel like the Alliance can make a difference. So uh, the, univers the University of Guelph has a mental health literacy program that is specifically target, targeted to the agricultural community. So we've been working uh, since those early days with the Canadian Mental Health Association, the University of Guelph and other local partners to now implement this program on the island. And we should be um, uh, initiating that training in, in early February. So we're just really excited about that and, and that we're able to make an early difference um, in this, this, this huge issue. And then uh, we're working to ensure that we have sort of an equitable approach to, to our information sharing. So of course that involves the web and social media. 
We have a new website now with over 600 tracked users. We're sharing new information regularly there about the grant program, the coaching service, the knowledge base, resiliency in general, and uh, again, in, in another nimble response to, to emerging needs on the island, we're going to be sharing very soon um, a resource of um, activities and, and tools that island families can be using to buffer stress uh, during this difficult time of homeschooling and sort of intensity around um, the, the COVID issues here on the island. And um, yeah, so we've got a Facebook page and Twitter and Instagram is coming. And of course, we're regularly communicating through, through the uh, breadth of island newspapers. So the last slide here just relates to, to next steps and sort of the, the key three points that I wanna leave you with today. And, and that is the sense that the Alliance is a community forward organization. We're focused on the upstream in support of the downstream. And our primary commitment is our partners. And we hope that you will invite us back regularly to discuss priorities, emerging issues, and give us the opportunity to continue to share updates with you. And some of the other key points here are that you know we're, we're working towards um, announcing our full first year work plan in, in, in the coming months. We're in the final stages of incorporation as a provincially registered not-for-profit corporation, after which we will announce a public call for applications for the inaugural Alliance Board. We're focused on building a small team and staffing key positions here on the island to support our work. We plan to report annually to the legislature and publicly, and we're working constantly to ensure that our work is, is grounded and relevant to communities across PEI. And, um, and as I mentioned, we, we really, really welcome the opportunity to, to provide regular updates to this committee. And so with that, I, I just genuinely wanna thank you for inviting us to your table today. And uh, I just wanna hand things back over to Gord and, and open things up to discussion and question. Well, Thank you very much, Karen. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that presentation. It was very informative and concise. And what we'll do is we will open it up to uh, to uh, the committee at this time for any questions. Um, so, Michelle, get us started. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I'm curious, out of the two million per year of that ten million dollars, how much is going to the organizations for, that are applying for money versus how much is going towards administration salaries and operation expenses of the alliance? So oh, you mentioned the two million. So two million of that grant program is is completely going into the hands of of communities. Great, Michelle. Thank you, Chair. So where's the operational money for salaries, consultation, and all that other, everything else coming from? Yes, yeah, so if there's an additional mil million dollars that's allocated to the Alliance annually to oversee operations, the collective action side, the, the research side of what we're doing, and, and basically that, that bringing together of, um, of communities. And... Michelle. Thanks, Chair. And is it expected that, that that $1 million will remain the operational budget of the organization, or will that change um, over the five-year period? What's the budget that has been set out for a five-year forecast? So it's expected that that budget will remain at $1 million. Um, the area that, that things are expected to grow is, is actually on the grant side where we have um, a strong intention to invest, to, to use this initial $2 million investment by the province and grow it by creating um, like a funding panel with, with other organizations off the island and encourage them to invest in the research and, and, and grant projects that are happening here on the island. Um, so the intention is really to grow that $2 million into um, additional funds for the community. Right. Michelle. Okay, thank you for that. So 
obviously the provincial government had been providing grants previous to the um, the creation of the alliance. What is happening to those grants that were being put out by the province? And are they being rolled up under the alliance as well under this initial capital outset, off, um, outlaying of money? So I, I, I don't want to speak for the province, but um, from the best of my understanding, uh, those grants will continue. I, I think you're speaking in particular about the ones coming out of the Chief Public Health Office. Those, those will continue and they're, they're separate from the work of the Alliance. This is, this is new money directed to mental well-being. Michelle. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for that answer. Um, and so one of the things that we've heard from not-for-profits all the time is around core funding, and it's extremely busy to continue their operations when they don't have core funding to pay for heat, lights, salaries, all that kind of thing, and that they are actually fundraising to do those, those types of operational expenses. And so we often get requests for core funding. And when the, the core funding isn't there, the application process to fill out grants and those kinds of things is often done off the corner of a desk um, so that they can keep their employees employed through pr projects and, and by um, getting grants and that kind of thing, exactly what this um, alliance is asking them to do, fill out more grant applications. So a lot of times, you've, your not-for-profit folks are often experts in filling out grants. They do it very quickly, very knowledge, knowledgeably, and they probably have more awareness of where the grant money is available for them across the country, nationally or in, in, internationally. So they're actually experts in filling out grant applications. So I'm wondering what, what concerns you're getting from your coaching process that um, and how what's being highlighted through that that process when you talk about how many people you're coaching? That's a great question, and and certainly you you definitely have your ear to the ground because this is something that came up in our in our community meetings and and what led us to uh, to think about how we could better support organizations that are extraordinarily busy and and already working off the sides of their desks. So I, I hear you and I agree with you on that. Um, What's coming up in the coaching sessions is that this is a bit of a new way of thinking for a lot of organizations who don't typically work in this very upstream realm. So they've got ideas, they've got initiatives that are that are actually maybe already in the community, but they're wondering how they could better tailor them to, to address this, this upstream approach to enhance resiliency. So the coaching uh, sessions are going to help them better understand that criteria and how they, they can tweak their programming to, to better align with it. And they're also just appreciating having somebody take the time to go through that material with them because it saves them having to sort of go through it on their own time, which is, as you rightly demonstrate, is, is often needed to address other more urgent issues. John, do you have anything that you want to add to that? I, I know yeah. you have a lot of experience in, in this realm as well. Yeah, I, I would like to add, uh, that's okay, Michelle. Um, so with the over 30 years that I've been involved with, uh, with different community organizations, um, you, you're correct and there is expertise, but for the most part, what happens nowadays is it's a, usually a third party that a lot of the organizations hire to do the grant work for them. So this is, you know, right back to what our mandate is. This is to build capacity within the organizations to allow them to feel more comfortable in, in this process. And, um, and, and it's like everything here, the, the, um, the size of the grants, the, the amount of funding for the grants, Michelle, the, the uh, you know, we're going to take all, this is very, very early stages. And this will evolve over time as the community directs us in, 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 in which way we want to evolve. Um, so I think that's a very important to understand that um, as we get the feedback, especially um, in these coaching sessions, our coaching will uh, streamline and change um, as the communities and the individual organizations need it to change. Michelle. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, and so it's interesting, this conversation, because often when we talk about grants, we're talking about com competition. So there is a, there's a defi defined 
bucket of money and organizations are competing for that money. And so I know one of the things that we're talking about here is, you know, how we can get groups to work together. But often when you've had to compete with other groups in order to keep your staff um, employed because you're looking for that grant money, how, how do you um, foresee building those relationships or um, trying to break down that competitiveness within grants that really governments have created by only giving buckets of money to um, a, a, a finite bucket of money and everybody just is fighting for those same dollars. Can I take this one, Karen, as well? Sure, sure. Um, so just to give you an example, Michelle, in our, in our, in our information session in um, uh, Stratford, it was very encouraging. We had, I, I believe, uh, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had 28 people there at that meeting. And what came out of that meeting, it was interesting, there was a lady there from early early childhood and uh, you know she raised her hand at the end of the meeting and the question and answer she was this is great that there was I heard about these grants today I didn't even really come here for that um, she goes I have to talk to that gentleman over there that with uh, with seniors and I want to connect with these individuals over here with Canadian Mental Health um, so I see it as an opportunity to break down those barriers of competition and maybe we'll have two and three organizations working together um, to, to bring something to the table that the community really needs. So um, that's what I'm hopeful for um, because you're, you're absolutely right. It, uh, it becomes a very competitive process. People uh, operate in silos. Um, and uh, I don't think you mentioned in the, in the presentation, one of the things that we're, we're working towards and already is planned is, a, uh, is an NGO or charitable organization uh, uh, annual um, uh, get together with EDs, and maybe that might even turn into a, a, a monthly type of round table because in, in our community meetings, uh, it was really expressed by the leadership in, in these groups out there. Uh, though they know of all the things that are going on, they know the other organization, there's never, there's, they don't really make the time or have an opportunity to get together. So that's, that's part of what our mandate is to facilitate that. Um, and we can talk about those challenges around the table of competition and so on and, and, and hopefully uh, alleviate the, the, the stresses of, of uh, what that brings. Okay, thank you. Chair, sure. If sure. you can put me on the list again. Okay, please. great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Rob, Rob Henderson. Uh, thanks. Thanks, John and Karen for your presentation there. And give a little bit more of an update on this. Uh, um, you'd mentioned you had a, a meeting in Elmsdale there, and of course I'm always usually trying to be on top of things, but anyway, I wasn't aware of that particular meeting, but I'm kind of curious to what organizations from Western PEI would have attended that meeting uh, to give me a sort of a sense of what the groups are that you're targeting. Absolutely. I, I, I don't have the comprehensive list in, in my head, but, but I can um, give you a sense that uh, CMHA was there. There was... Um, uh, an individual that actually driven all the way there from Borden who has her own personal sort of well-being coaching service where she's looking for uh, groups to connect with. Um, John, can you remember any of the other? So the minister also attended that meeting just, just sort of on behalf of the constituency there uh, with, with that hat on out of interest just to hear what was happening. Um, there was... There was a lady uh, uh, and her husband from uh, Summerside uh, that has worked that just uh, moved back uh, from Ontario, um, and um, she her work has been in, in in mental health and well-being, and they were very interested to, to hear what was going on and want to and uh, want to know if they could volunteer and how they could get involved. Um, there was um, uh, oh. Um, there were four I, can't, I can't remember, but it was it was uh, the Council for Dis Dis Disabilities. But I, uh, the new name uh, forsakes me here right now. Uh, but they, they were represented as well, and uh, there was one other organization that I can't think of at this time. It was one of those, like I said, small, intimate groups and uh, excellent, uh, excellent discussion. And uh, you could feel the support and the strength in the in the room. Um, and that's what I like about these uh, smaller sessions. Uh, you know, the one in Stratford was great with the 28 people, um, but uh, this is this is what I really look forward to, um, uh, Robert. In my my experience with uh, with uh, 2014, which you realize there was a lot of community work there, 
Um, it was getting out to these smaller uh, groups where things really happen on the ground. And that is, that, that's the goal of the Alliance because that's where the differences will be made. That's where the challenges will be met is, is in our communities with small organizations and with the, with Islanders that are doing great work out there. And we just have to harness it and share those ideas and, and, and get them around our table. Yeah, no, and, and to be fair, like I say, the, the, you didn't have the Lennox Island meeting, which is actually in my riding, and maybe uh, uh, there'd be more groups uh, from around the area. But uh, anyway, I guess so my thinking would be, uh, so you had a limited amount of groups that were there, which is fine, uh, but how do these organizations, and I'm sure there'd be many other organizations that can help uh, enhance uh, the improvement of mental health issues throughout, say, Western PEI, uh, so how do these organizations apply, and how do I get the information out to these other organizations that maybe didn't attend or didn't wear? So basically for my role as an MLA to try to advocate for those groups to uh, get the proper information and m maybe make them think a little bit. So I'm assuming there's maybe a website they apply to or something along that line. And, and maybe to not take up a whole lot of time, maybe Karen could send me a, a link or send me the application forms or something along that line to uh, then I can distribute them out to uh, my constituency and the groups within that. Absolutely. So we have a, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Sorry. So um, this is one of the, the, the virtual meeting challenges. So um, we do have a comprehensive website that has a full suite of information about the grant program and, and the peer committee um, call for membership and the coaching service and, and the, you know, the background on the criteria and all of that. So I will definitely prepare a little package for you that, that you can email out to, to your constituency. And, um, and I'll give you a sense of, of the different social media tools that we have where interested people in your community can, um, can follow. And also you can encourage them whenever you chat with them in person to feel very, very welcome to reach out to us at any time. And as John said, I, I love to have uh, coffees with people. So, and, and chat about this stuff in person, because that's where you really make the connections and, and understand what the, uh, the interests are by people in your community. So I'd really welcome the opportunity to, uh, to do that once we're in a COVID safe situation. Rob? Okay, no, and I appreciate that. And I guess my, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up with a final question. Now, originally, government had planned a, a, a sort of a center for mental health well-being. Uh, now, is this, does this link into this alliance with any of that, or is this something that's totally separate and government will be doing this on its own? And, and if there is any linkage, any updates on where that's at? I'm so glad you brought that up because you, you just actually made me realize that I left that out of my presentation. So... The initial announcement in, in April of 2021 called for the establishment of a center for mental well-being, but that has actually morphed into the Alliance for Mental Well-Being uh, for the very fact that the community kind of buffered at the, the, the term center in the sense that that sounded like a bricks and mortar kind of service providing entity. And, and so we worked to find a name that, that reflected better the, the mandate of the Alliance. And um, as I mentioned, just very briefly again um, in the presentation, so we can speak more to it at another time if you like, but we're working actively right now to incorporate the Alliance and, and hopefully within the next two weeks, I'll actually be sitting outside of government um, as, a, as a formal not-for-profit member of the community. Rob? So, so it sounds a bit more like a virtual centre, more so than, like I said, a bricks-and-mortar centre, is that, or, or you're not sure of that? <laughs> yeah, it's, virtual isn't quite the, the best word, just the sense that we're, that the term centre made members in the community feel like we were offering services related to mental health and, and potentially addictions, where, where really what we're doing is we're supporting the organisations that are delivering services on the island. We're, and, and so the term alliance is meant to give that sense of, of our collaborative nature and, and how we're harnessing the network that exists. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just, I'll just take a second. This time we're going to go to uh, uh, Carlo Bernard. I'd ask you to unmute your mic, and then uh, you, have the, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, 
I guess there's a couple of different directions that that I'm drawn to go in. Um, you had talked about uh, mobilizing and promoting common knowledge. Um, I'm wondering what this looks like in practice. So how will Islanders see you at work and what differences will they experience in their life to see that we are working towards uh, implementing services for mental health as which is exactly what we need. So, so I was a bit surprised when I heard about the research center morphing into this because offering services is exactly what we need to do. And so I hear you say supporting community organizations to do this work, absolutely, that's a crucial part. So I guess I'm just wondering that a whole lot just to, to ask the question, how will Islanders see you at work and what difference will they experience in their life as a result of your work? just start by clarifying any potential confusion there so when um member henderson asked his question i i thought he was referring to the announcement for the center for mental well-being not not the research center that still is its own entity and 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 you know a bit separate but potentially a partner of mine the intention of the center was always what it what it is rolling out to be, and, and that's to be a, a not-for-profit entity that is working to mobilize the field. So we'll, we'll just clarify that. But when, when you say, um, you know, how will Islanders see, see the mobilization of that knowledge base at work? And I, I think the best place to start with that is, is actually through the grant program. Because the, the, the community groups and, and entities that go into the field with a grant project or initiative, those those initiatives will, will be based on this common knowledge base. And that's very simply said, those three action areas of strengthening relationships between Islanders, building core life skills and reducing stress. So the whole intention is that, um, I think we can all agree there's a lot happening on the, on the island. There's a lot of groups with great intention doing a lot of really good work. Our, our hope, and mandate is to bring those groups together and, and help them focus their efforts around this, this common sense of, or, or this common approach to mental well-being that is based in science and, and based in evidence. So they'll see, they'll see the alliance in action through those activities that are going to be starting in communities as, as early as April. Uh, Carla? Thank you, Chair. So, so it's going to be the community organizations doing that work through your funding. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's just one really clear example of, of how they'll see the alliance at work. That that our grant program is going to basically empower communities to do this work on their own. Like they're going to identify what they want to do with the resources, and then we're going to empower them with them to go and do them and support them along the way with professional development and options for knowledge translation and partnership, uh, a tangible option uh, around knowledge or knowledge translation or workshops that they're asking for. They said, can you bring us together in the months to come to talk about resiliency and well-being? Can, can we have panels and discussions with each other uh, about what this looks like? And then, um, and then we can further develop partnerships when we're bringing them together. Like John referred to earlier, groups are really hungry to come together and, and partner. And, and COVID has unfortunately, you know, made that very difficult. And we're hoping that we can come out of the gates here and, and, and create the opportunity for groups to come together around our table, with us buying that pot of coffee and, and creating the space for them to come together around. John, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, Carla, what I'm trying to understand it. So, you know, you were talking about, you know, dollars for, for mental health services. And this, the alliance isn't, isn't really the dollars for, for mental health services. Um, the alliance is being created as another entity. And, it, you know, it was, and it was created, uh, you know, uh, as, an, as another uh, offer in mind to help build the capacity and resiliency, um, not, to, uh, not to offer uh, mental health services and, and these types of things. There's already, uh, at, you know, at one point in time, and I don't know what the number is now, Carl, there's over 400 um, charitable organizations in Prince Edward Island. 
Um, and uh, so I, I think it's to, it's to harness that good work to have somebody to quarterback and bring people together um, is, the, is the big emphasis for us. Not, we're, not the, we're not getting involved in that, uh, that acute care system and so on. Uh, we are um, more of a, like I said, a quarterback that's gonna bring, uh, bring organizations together. We use the symbol of the table uh, conversations and, 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 uh, and so on. We've already brought, uh, to, you know, there's all kinds of examples of, of, uh, you know, the one that, uh, Karen used with, uh, um, the crisis with the PEI potato, uh, wharf, um, you know, the department of agriculture has been brought together with the university of Guelph, which has been brought together with, with Canadian mental health and PEI. And there's, so, um, it's just, it's recognizing those opportunities and, uh, and making a difference in, in, in helping. So if we, you know, if we relieve the stress of a farm family or, or, or um, you know, um, uh, can help in that, that's an example of our, of our goals and our mandates um, as we move forward. And that, and again, Carol, that will shift and change as community uh, needs and priorities change as well. Carla? Thank you for that. And um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to get a sense of, of um, how this works and, and what exactly um, the, that the Alliance is offering. So, um, so you're right, community groups are hungry to come together. There's so much division in trying to access the same funds, reinventing the wheel in order to access project-based funding. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, Michelle already kind of addressed this. So I hope that obviously you're aware of that. You, you already said that, but I do hope that that the competitiveness, if we want to pull them together, we have to remove that competitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just a little comment there. But so I'm, I'm wondering where, where did the idea of this stem from? Who, who was um, asking for, for this service? Well, I think, you know, that certainly happened before I, I started with the organization. I, I, I mentioned in, in my presentation that, that the, the sort of emerging call to action for this has been underway for, for years now. When, when we look at the um, CPHO report in 2016 and the strategy, it, it, it calls for, a, you know, a whole of island um, health for all islanders type approach. And I, I know at senior levels in, in the province in, in early 2021, they were starting to explore, um, you know, making greater investments in the mental health and addictions field. But from my understanding, uh, they wanted to also look at, you know, why do we have this disproportionate demand of, of Islanders in the acute, what we call, you know, bed-based system? Where, where, where are they coming from and, and how can we potentially change that? that trajectory of, of people that are, that are ending up there. And so um, the exploration began to try to look at a different way of doing things. And what quickly emerged from the field, uh, I, I think they reached out beyond to the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, you know, other national groups to say, what are other jurisdictions doing? How is this being approached um, in, in other provinces? And I, I think that was one piece of, of their exploration, but they came to the conclusion that if they could create an entity that sits outside of government, that gets to completely focus on this issue and, and isn't completely pulled all the time into the churn of, of, of issues um, and, and, and taken away from its mandate, then we can really make a difference in, in this domain. And, and there came the idea of creating the Alliance for Mental Well-Being. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe I'll ask one more question and then you can, you can move on if there's others on your list. Um, so going back to providing this, the funding, uh, I'm kind of wondering where the number of $1 million came from. I, you know, I, 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 as I sit back and reflect on all of the amazing work that our community partners are doing, you know, I can't help but wonder rather than, you know, of course, offering the support is needed. I really like that service that you offer. Um, but sometimes I wonder rather than 
than having them go through this process if we were to just see the good work they are doing and acknowledge it by giving them the operational funding that they so desperately need to be able to do their amazing work. So on that note, I'm wondering um, what staff has, how many staff have been hired to help you with um, the, the funding process and the coaching and all of that stuff and, and kind of where this $1 million ask came from? So, you know, I, I can't speak to to where the one million dollar ask came from is it, you know, it, it came sort of b before the alliance was created. But I can speak to the fact that um, right now we're, we're in this transition period of, of moving the alliance out of government. So there are a number of staff working with me, um, actually virtually sharing expertise in this domain um, from other jurisdictions. And then there's two island based staff here. Um, working directly with me and uh, we hope to grow that in the months to come once we actually become incorporated and, and I can hire people um, under the alliance uh, through, through an open process, um, you know, open to all islanders and beyond because I mean it, it never hurts to attract people um, with expertise to the island as well. It's chair, oh, Carla. If, if I could just ask one quick follow-up question on that. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so there's two staff hired on the island, and did I hear you correctly in saying there are staff that have been hired from outside of the province? And I'm wondering where these jobs were posted. So th this was. Um, th there's a group of people working with me from other jurisdictions that um, have been involved in, in the early days of sort of the, the genesis of, of, of the establishment of, of the alliance before it, it actually even be became um, an entity that was announced in November. So it, it's difficult to, to hire people formally um, for, for this early development phase when, when we didn't have anything to hire them into. So you're kind of seeing um, a, an organization that is, that is at work. I mean, we have announced the grant program. We're super excited about that, that we're going to be able to share that money with, with communities in this fiscal year. We're also building the organization as, as we speak. So um, in a few weeks, I'm going to have an organization that I'll be able to hire people into. So to be quite frank with you, I've been working with a very, very small team that is working extremely hard to be able to, to launch this grant program and the coaching program. So that, you know, that, that's, that's why I'm in the situation that I am because we're, instead of just focusing on building the organization, we also wanted to, to get this money out the door. Thank you, thank you Karen, thank you, Carla. Um, we'll go to Zach. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, John and uh, Karen, for your presentation. Uh, it was uh, great to see because I, I did have a chance to uh, attend the meeting in Stratford. And I also had a chance to sit down with Karen over the holidays. Um, the one quick question, I just have like two very quick questions, and you might know the answers, you might not. Um, the call for the committee members went out a week ago. Um, is there any uptake? And how many people, I don't know if you mentioned this in the presentation, how many committee members are you hoping to have? That's a great question because I'm actually thrilled to be able to speak about it because the more word we can spread about the peer committee, um, the, the better because we want to have a really diverse mix of Islanders and uh, and, and Canadians potentially that, that represent uh, the groups that will be submitting applications. So we're hoping to have about 10 people for this initial peer committee, but really through the process, we wanna um, create a, a pool of, of interested people that would like to be involved in, in the peer committee. So I don't have um, a formal report right now on the number of people that, is, that have expressed interest because the deadline is actually January 30th. But um, I'd be very, very uh, pleased to come back and, and report on, on this and, and other things in, in the weeks or months to come. Thank you, Karen Sack. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Karen. Um, so the second question is in relation to the streams. So there is the four streams. And again, maybe this is more of a question for that committee once it's created, but is there gonna be like an equal representation? Like, are you hoping to get 25% of the funding will go through stream one, 25% through stream two, et cetera? Or is that something that's going to be developed along the way? 
So it, it is a different uh, allocation for each stream. Um, I'm just I'm just gonna pull it up. John, do you have that in mind? What the full total is for each stream? I don't have it in front of me uh, here, Karen. But again, uh, Zach, we, we do have we do have it now. The percentage for each stream, but I I think um, you know that's an initial uh, look at it. And, and uh, I'll go back to um, as the needs uh, from the community come up, that's going to be subject to change. The streams may change. There may be more streams at it. There may be less streams and the amounts and durations of, of grants may change as well. Um, again, dictated by the priorities of, uh, of what we're going to see over the community. Thank well, you. Zach, I can follow up with you shortly after the meeting. I, I've got a document here that, that captures it all. It's actually all on the web as well. Um, but I, I just don't want to um, say anything incorrect here. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow back up with the allocations to the committee, if that would be helpful. Zach? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, one more quick question. So uh, in the presentation, it says the Alliance takes the whole of PEI approach in supporting communities and their population uh, health, et, et cetera. I won't read the whole uh, paragraph, but um, again, just going, kind of going into the breakdown, um, you know, the, the differences island-wide are probably going to be great. Is Do you see that maybe as a hurdle to try to determine how that funding, you know, whether West Prince gets a percentage, Charlottetown gets a percentage, or uh, Kings County gets a percentage? I, th I think this also touches on the point that, that Carla made. And, and I, I think the best way to look at it is, is, is from, from two focuses. We want to have a whole of island approach. And, and with that, we mean um, all islanders can see themselves benefiting from this. And, and we want to ensure that all regions have, a, have an equitable chance to get involved in this. But, but really, the focus should be on the priorities that emerge from, from the communities. So sh instead of just giving um, sort of funding out to groups again, as has been done for years and years, the intention is that the Alliance will help community groups target the funding to where the greatest need is. And, and that's going to emerge in the months to come when we, when we start to have those conversations, collect better data, understand um, the surveillance activities that are happening and, and perhaps have people more focused on analyzing that data so that we can really, really target resources and address the greatest need um, as, as our top priority. Thank you. Um, we'll move to Michelle. Um, all right, I'm just going to go right back to something. I didn't necessarily hear this um, outlined in the presentation, but can you tell me um, what is the actual outcomes that government has asked you to achieve on an annual basis um, as part of this new alliance? Well, you know what? The, the answer to your question is government hasn't asked the alliance to outcome anything specifically. They've asked us to work with the community to identify what our priorities should be. And, and, and that will be yet to be determined. And, and that's why I'm committing so clearly to you today that I want to come back to be able to talk to you about those as they emerge from the community. Uh, that's the different way of doing things here that I mentioned in slide two. The government isn't dictating what the community needs to do. The government is asking the community to dictate what should be done. John, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, you know, again, I, I would I would just try to strengthen what you said there, Karen. Um, as, as we've been saying from the from the beginning, is that this is going to evolve as the community needs change and priorities change. Um, and uh, I would expect, though, uh, it would only be prudent on the government's part. They're going to, you know, in this committee that we come back and uh, we present our budgets, we present where our, our funding went, we show our results, we have accountability. Um, it's, it is taxpayers' dollars and it should always be accountable. Um, so I, I, I would fully ex expect that. And as Karen said, the full 
full budget is uh, is uh, first year operating budget is is going to be uh, presented in the uh, in the weeks to come. It will be available. Michelle, thanks, Chair. So I think this is where I'm struggling. So value for money of Islanders taxpayer dollars, you're being given a million dollars, but no mandate, like no defined outcomes so that you can report back on how the Alliance is, is um, doing compared to those agreed upon. Usually you would have agreed upon outcomes if you're provided money. And so that's where I guess I'm struggling from because I believe that we should always have um, some way to evaluate the value of money spent from of taxpayers and how what they're getting for that money. And so I'm not hearing a mandate in order for Islanders to say, okay, yes, we should proceed with this next year because this makes sense and we have taken the, this many steps forward. Um, as compared to if the alliance wasn't in existence before. So I'm struggling with normally any other organization that's asking for money from the government has to provide a, an operational budget ask, which is what they're going through now for pre-budget consultations. And anybody who's requested money from the government knows just how incredibly difficult that is and how incredibly difficult it is to get that money because there's very little in the operational budget that can be, you know, moved here and there unless you're going to increase the overall spend. So that's what I'm challenged with right now is that that value for money and where's the accountability to ensure that this $100 operational budget that the Alliance has is being spent to best to achieve the best outcomes for Islanders. Well, it, you know, it's an extraordinarily important point. And, and I'll just remind you that uh, we're just in early days here. We're working actively to to incorporate ourselves so that then we can then legally establish our board and and that governing board is 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 the group that's going to hold the alliance accountable uh, you know along with yourselves but you have to remember we haven't yet had the time to establish that mandate establish those objectives establish that vis that vision and those indicators that we can then be measured by so um, you know give us a, a, a little bit of time here to actually establish the organization uh, uh, formally, and I'll be thrilled to come back to you and and report on those things. Thank you, Chair. Michelle, Thank you. thanks, Chair. I guess that's where my challenge is. Is you know, I'm just trying to point out if any business came to a bank and didn't come with a business plan, they wouldn't be given a million dollars, let alone three million dollars. So. That's where I'm struggling to understand how this all came to fruition in the first place. If somebody didn't come to government to say, I have this plan, I think it will really work, can I get this amount of money in order to achieve the goals that I'm setting out in my plan, I don't understand how we came to the decision, yes, this is a great idea, if there was never a plan presented in the first place. I, you know, I, I again, I, I, I just have to reiterate. Um, this was established as a priority uh, by the province in in April of 2021, and um, it it's taken time to actually establish the organization. So, um, you know, we're, we're we're taking a very open and transparent approach in in being out there in the community. You know, being here today with you, sharing with you everything that we're doing. Um, I. I can't answer that yet because we're just not there yet. Michelle. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, so um, you had mentioned, so we had some discussion around the research center, the Center for Mental, well Mental Health Wellbeing, which, which is not in existence anymore because that's now the Alliance. Can you tell me, so Part of what, when you had presented to our caucus in the first place, part of the the um, mandate, mandate that you were taking on was going out to get research and to have research done and to accumulate that research. How are you working with the Mental Health Research Center? And my understanding is that there's no longer a director. So is that actually a functioning um, 
arm of government right now in which you can actually work with the mental health research center? Does that even exist for your purposes? So it's my understanding that they're, you know, actively working to to replace the executive director there. You really have to redirect your questions, uh, you know, to the Ministry of Health to, for the specifics around this. But um, I'm actively working now since we, we were able to, you know, take care of that, that core piece of our mandate in, in getting the, the grant program out the door in December. Now I'm working on the other side of our work, which is to, to enhance sort of that knowledge mobilization. So I'm just waiting until um, the research center is, is uh, you know, fully staffed so that I can begin to work more closely with them. And, and I'll be honest that, that I'm not fully aware of, of, of how it's functioning right now. And it's, it's one of the things I'm going to be looking into in the next couple of weeks. I have just met recently with the provincial epidemiologist and um, I'm just doing a, a number of outreach right now on the, the research side of things to be able to better understand uh, where we can start to, to work together in, in this realm. Michelle? Thanks, Chair. Okay, so one, my understanding is that this is an arm's length organization from government. Can you outline why it was felt that this needed to be arm's length and why this couldn't be achieved within the, within a, the Department of Health and Wellness, for instance? Okay, so I mentioned that, that in my presentation that the reason that the Alliance has been established to exist outside of government is so that it can work more closely within the community and that once the board is established and we do have that clear mandate and vision and, and objectives that, that we just discussed, we can follow that mandate and, and not be sort of shifted by the shifts of government. Um, we can, of course, work with government, but we're, we're not directed by government then. We're directed by the community and our board. That, that's the full intention of, of having the alliance established outside of government so that we can sit within the community and be driven by the needs of the community as opposed to, um, you know, at times political needs and, and, and those things that influence the work of government. Michelle? Okay, thanks, Chair. And as an arm's length organization from government, do you have to submit a budget request every year? Um, so, for instance, we're working on operation budgets right now for 22-23. Have you already been told that your budget's going to be a million dollars, or do you actually have to apply for operational funding based on a plan that you're still working on? Yes, we will have to apply for that, just like other not-for-profit organizations. Michelle? Okay, thanks, Chair. And so is it fair to say that in this budget present, this budget request that you submit for 2022-2023, you will have a defined plan that will include outcomes and how you're going to achieve those outcomes and how you're going to measure according to those outcomes and report on them? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Sure. On this, on this uh, section... Um, Chair, so sure. for 2021 2023, have you spent a 2021 2022? Sorry, getting my uh, my years mixed up. Um, have you spent um, like will you have spent a million dollars for since you came into um, fruition to the end of the year? We're just actually um, working on those numbers right now, but I can assure you we've definitely spent less than a million dollars and um, especially considering we, we just started in the fall. So our, our numbers are going to be considerably less than a million dollars. And I don't know where that additional money will be allocated, but I know that it will be within, within the health and wellness budget. Okay. Sure. You can go to somebody okay. else if you. Um, I'm, I just want to check really quickly with um, Carla and Ola who are online. Um, to see if they have any uh, follow-up questions there, and then I might ask a couple. Um, Ola Hammerland? Uh, you, have to, you have to take yourself off, off the mute, the, the button. Yeah. Yeah, just trying. There we go. Thank you, Chair. Just trying to find a button. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you for the great presentation. There's a lot of beautiful words in there. Uh, I particularly like uh, tackling problems upstream as well as downstream. Uh, although I feel a little bit to see how exactly what you're doing will result in action. But uh, anyway, maybe you could tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the uh, potato crisis, which doesn't seem to me primarily being a mental health issue. But anyway, how did you uh, get involved in that? And what was your actions there? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a, and it's a great example of, of how this work, if, you know, from a distance is, is sometimes a little bit hard to, to see where, where it'll have an impact. So when um, the potato wart crisis came to sort of the, the public domain in, in, in November, I reached out to a colleague over in, um, or a, a gentleman that that I that I know in the Department of Agriculture and Land, uh, to talk about the Farmers Talk program, which which I had already been aware of. And this uh, this is a program that's been established by the Department of Agriculture to support farming families and and mental health issues that uh, people in that community are facing with kind of a tailored approach of, of counseling and triage. And so the potato wart crisis will definitely intensify any issues that, that families are, are facing. So I asked the department if there was any way that the Alliance could help them to sort of amplify the work that they're doing or uh, extend the outreach of, of the Farmers Talk program. So they mentioned that they had been made privy to a presentation by the University of Guelph of a program called In the Know. And In the Know kind of takes Farmers Talk to another level in that Farmers Talk provides counseling from an EAP service to farm families. Farmers Talk really dives in to a mental health literacy approach that's specifically tailored and developed within the agricultural community. So this program, in, in, as we're working in partnership, uh, as John mentioned, with the Canadian Mental Health Association and, and their, their trainers to train the trainers. So there'll be individuals here in the island that are, that are trained by uh, specialists from the University of Guelph who will then lead a session that, that, that we will convene and organize with members of the farm community such as uh, potentially veterinarians and uh, representatives from feed companies, other people that touch members of the farm community so that they can identify mental health issues uh, as they're emerging in individuals and, and help provide them or help direct them to, to more services. Ola? Well, thank you. Um, uh, the potato farmers obviously need all the help they can need, but there's like, thousands of other people in an organization that also needs help. Like for instance, uh, the current issue in my writing is uh, uh, seniors uh, projects where, where regular residents are being mixed with uh, uh, other seniors that uh, clearly have mental issues and needs. So uh, my question is, uh, are you planning to jump in and and offer your help and suggestions there on how would that work? Uh, clearly, they need both upstream and downstream help. How will you step in and help places like okay. that? Sure, sorry. So I'll start and then maybe I'll, 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 I'll encourage John to, to build on my response. But um, so the seniors community is certainly welcome to, to come forward and, and identify those issues to, to us at the Alliance, first and foremost, to, to take a look at the grant program and, and see if there's an opportunity that, that funds could be directed to those issues. But my main point is that our table is, is wide open for, for everyone to come and, and start to identify those issues so that we can prioritize them. Seniors isolation, seniors mental health, um, th those, those are two issues that I don't think we've had a meeting where it hasn't been mentioned. So, so I hear you and, and I think there's going to be a great emphasis on that in the, in the months to come. But as I mentioned to, um, to Michelle, you know, we're in early days. We're kind of, we're just getting our, our table established. So it, it's hard for me to come straight out and say, you know, these are the, these are the five priorities that the community has identified for urgent action in, in, a, in a framework as um, uh, 
so I, I, I guess my, my best answer right now is that um, they're, they're welcome to come and identify those and, and they're welcome to get involved in, in the grant program. John, do you want to add to that at all? Well, I think it's important that, that, you know, all of us are individuals as part of the community. Um, uh, uh, Robert Henderson there mentioned, to, you know, he would like to have information for his riding. Ola, I would encourage you, if it's in, in your riding, we've all, we previously had a conversation with Gord about seniors as well. So I would, I would encourage you, if you can identify a group um, that you connect them with, with us, you can be part of that as well. This is what I see this being able to have. We can be a liaison initiator. So I know there is some, there is some uh, small programs at Canadian Mental Health that deal with, with, with seniors, but maybe this is another uh, venture into a new initiative that we get somebody like Canadian Mental Health involved that becomes part of, of, of one of the programs and we start to, to uh, tackle those issues. Like you say, you know, the farmers is one issue, seniors is another issue. There, there, there's, there's numerous issues and challenges. It's going to be, um, it, it, you know, it, it will be difficult to prioritize, but we will have to prioritize based on, uh, based on the greatest needs. So I really encourage you to, uh, you know, to, uh, in, you see a particular issue in your, your riding to bring that forward and, uh, and help us uh, bring those individuals to the table. Ola? Uh, thank you. Um... It's, it's great that you're offering help with grants. It still seems to me to be a difference. Uh, the way you describe it, you took action with, uh, with helping the farmers, which is a good thing. But uh, for the seniors, uh, which have similar problem, and, and they're just one of many, many places where action is needing, you seem to be sitting back in your chair and waiting for them to apply for a grant that you may train them in the application, but it sounds like you're sitting back as opposed to stepping up. So we're, can I answer that chair? Sure, yes, please. Um, so as you know, we started in September, Ola, we're, you know, we haven't been incorporated yet. Um, I think we've done an amazing, or you know, not, not, you know, mostly Karen and the, the other two individuals in the office have done an amazing, amazing job. Uh, so far in the, in the number of contacts we've been able to make. Um, and we're, 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 we're not sitting back and it's not, and, and, and I think it's important to realize that this, the grant program is, is one small piece of this. Um, I, I, I don't want the focus all to be on the grant. I think it's as, as important or more important is the relationships are gonna be built and how we're gonna help organizations in our community uh, come together so they can support each other so that we don't have uh, duplication and, and, and so on in services. And we use the expertise where the expertise can be used. Um, I think it's, uh, I think that's, if anything, that's our most important thing that the, that these organizations, our ED um, summit that we're going to have or ED meetings, um, that they will feel supported. Uh, they will support each other. So it, it's, it's putting the grant program aside, the important work is in bringing the community together and harnessing all that energy and all those good things that aren't happening. And where there's real challenges and issues, then how can those organizations help other entities that need their challenges fixed as well? Thank you, John. Ola? Oh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Carla? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I guess I'm going to kind of piggyback off what Ola just said. Um, I think that one of the the um, positive things in here is is exactly the example that you provided about the farmers uh, in the in the recent potato wart crisis. And so I, I like how we're open to understanding the social determinants of health. And an organization that we may not associate with mental health would be eligible, I'm assuming, based on, on, on what I've heard here today, would be eligible for these funds. And the coaching program would give them an opportunity to kind of explain why this is relevant to mental health 
in Prince Edward Island. So, so that's one, one thing that, that I see as a real positive here in terms of engaging community organizations, connecting them, and, and not reinventing the wheel. And one of the examples that, that we talked about, Karen and John, when you met with our caucus, was the, the example that I brought up about the PEI Literacy Alliance and how they were tasked with um, you know, helping adults learn how to read. And one of the challenges and barriers that they ran into that just made it impossible for them to sustain this work was the fact that they were finding that oftentimes the reasons that adults had such high um, rates, such um, low rates of, of reading or literacy is because they had experienced some trauma in their life and they were running up against this barrier. And so rather than learning how to read, they found themselves having to deal with all of this other stuff first. And so that was one of the initiatives that you had said that, that you would be interested in supporting. So I just kind of wanted to bring that in for a little bit of context because I think that that's, that's really important. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm gonna jump off that and ask a question that's not really related, but I'm wondering if there are similar groups in other jurisdictions that have taken this approach. I appreciate you saying something positive finally, <laughs> or there, there being some positive feedback on this today, because um, th that is what it's all about. And, and that idea of seeing th those entities um, that we wouldn't normally associate with a mental well being approach getting involved. And then that all goes back to that harnessing of assets that we have on the island and making better use of resources. And, and your literacy example is, is a perfect one of the problems that emerge in the system and then how can we we unpack them and look at the different sectors and groups that can help to tackle them more upstream. And so we are seeing some really interesting ideas emerge from, from a variety of different communities. Um, around Kensington, there was a, a, a really um, interesting and, and motivated young gentleman come to our community meeting who has, for example, a um, an outdoor experience uh, initiative or, or company. And he wants to be able to share that, uh, th that resource with uh, newcomers specifically to, to the island. And he was wondering if he could get involved in a grant program. Now, he, and he's a business and, and of course he could and but we, we talked to him about how he'd have to sort of ground his initiative with it with a not for, for profit entity so um and, and i think he you know he's gone back to explore what that could look like we had a restaurant come forward in, in another jurisdiction who has a space that's available and open all winter but is grounded in a very active um, community in, in, in the cultural sort of sense. And, and they wanna be able to offer that space potentially to young Islanders so that they can come have a cultural experience, build some life skills, build relationships with, with other um, potentially elderly people in their community by um, having a, a session with them. So there you've got a, a private sector entity, a restaurant, which we wouldn't typically think about in, in the well-being realm, thinking about working with, with seniors and, and creating an intergenerational project with local youth, which also has a, a spin-off effect of providing uh, a stress buffering resource to parents where they know that their kids are partaking in a healthy activity after school. So it gives that, that busy mom a little more time to deal with her day. So it's, it's sort of looking at it from, from all those aspects. So I think, I think those are two, two examples. John, is there another one that comes to mind of sort of some of those outliers um, that have come forward just in initial discussions? Oh, you're putting me on the, on the spot Sorry, here. Sorry, John. No, I I'm, I'm just fading here. Uh, anyway, uh, no, I, look, I, the example is, 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 is great, Carla, um, you know, because literacy, if, if trauma is something that's, 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 uh, you know, uh, stopping them for, from that individual from reaching their full potential, then again, and I mean, I, and I, you know, maybe it is an organization like Canadian Mental Health. I, I don't like to keep using them as example. They're piling all kinds of work in here. Shelly's not going to be happy with me, but, um, you know, maybe there is a program somewhere that's already established and we can link those people with literacy with a, with a, with a program or with a group. Um, and again, 
you know, a lot of our work is going to be hidden. The results are going to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be some, they'll be measurable uh, back to part of Michelle's question, but you know, the greatest results will actually come from stories that we might not even, might not even hear about. Uh, uh, the other example, I guess, in our, in our uh, launch in our press conference, we had a guest speaker, a young lady from Eastern PEI, uh, a, a UPEI student, and, and she talked about her experiences at 4-H, and she talked about a simple uh, turkey dinner that they used to do at Thanksgiving that started with a handful of people and grew to over, a, over 100 people. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a, 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 you know, she really got the, the concept of upstream because what they were, you know, and back to Ola's comment as well, there was a number of seniors in the community that came out to these dinners and that's why it grew and it, and it created this, uh, this community strength and resiliency and, and bonding. And, and, and it was young people that were, that were providing the services and working together. So, it was working on the mental well-being of the young people. It was working on the mental well-being of the of the uh, of the seniors, and that's what this is. That's what this is all about. And and like you say, there's so many things. Whether it's from you know literacy, um, seniors, um, you know we haven't even talked about uh, addictions and so on. But that's a, that's a big part of it. I mean, you know, Karen has uh, has already linked some in, individuals that are uh, working on. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of the outreach center today, but that that's being uh, worked on. And Karen has linked people up in uh, in Ottawa with her contacts on um, what uh, what some of the models could look like. Um, and uh, you know, again, so that's you're not going to necessarily be able to measure that, but the contacts and the and the influence that will be there uh, will make differences and make changes in our in our community. Well, Carla. Uh, thank you, Chair, and and I really appreciate that. And and there's no doubt, I you know I, of course it's it's our job to kind of dig into things and and you know question things. And so, um, one of the things that you know we're just we understand the the severe need for um, for a few different things that you've spoken about here today in terms of linking community organizations and um, oh. Gosh, I lost my train. But but anyway, to, to thank you for, for that work. And I look forward to seeing what that looks like in a few years. And that's kind of why we're being critical because there's been nothing really given to us in terms of, of the mandate and, and all of that stuff. And so you're left to figure that out. And I guess my mind always goes back to um, if, if a community organization were coming to you for for funding and that's kind of their thing. Oh, just trust us and, and we'll do this. So that's, you know, that's where the, the critical piece comes from. It's not that, you know, we, we don't want to see you succeed and do really well in this. Um, I guess I just my final question and then I, I'm done. Um, so I, I, I know I lumped a whole bunch of my comment and then asked a question. So I'm just wondering if you can point us to any other jurisdictions that have this model. So not specifically, and, and, and that speaks to the innovative uh, sort of approach here, but there are, um, we are reaching out to, uh, for example, British Columbia, who has really made an emphasis in, in, in one of their provincial departments, but um, there, there is no province as far as I'm aware that has an entity that, that has been given this sort of uh, focus and, and space to do this work. Um, there's, there's academic entities such as the Resiliency uh, Center at Dalhousie University, um, other, other not-for-profit orga not -profit organizations certainly have an emphasis for well-being, but this kind of structure that we're building here is a bit unprecedented. Um, there are municipalities that, that have a strong emphasis on this upstream approach. Um, but and, and and we're working and, and linking with with all of those groups, but in terms of a, a, a replica of what we're doing in another province, we we don't have it, and that's kind of exciting and 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 it's and it, it's challenging too because we're carving a, a new path here. And Prince Edward Island has the opportunity to be a, a leader in in the country in this work, and that's that's what's you know 
getting John out of the bed at 4.30 in the morning in BC and, and you know, uh, inspiring me to keep working through long, really challenging days is that we feel we're, we're really onto something that's going to make a massive change for our neighbours and, and for our, our children on this island. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Karen. We'll go to Thank you. Uh, Michelle to wrap up our questions, and I might have a few questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple um, that I'm <coughs> curious about. So when we have a, a single point of contact, you know, and usually government departments would be that and collecting data to identify where they're seeing trends happening. Um, is that something now that these are coming into government, this requests would be coming in to you and obviously you would think that not-for-profits are going to be trying to fulfill needs that are coming into their organization so therefore they're going to be requesting grant money in order to fulfill those gaps are those is that data that you'll be consolidating in the reporting and knowing that you're going to be reporting on an annual basis would that be something like recommendations that you could present to government prior to when you're seeing um, a, a very clear thread of uh, needs or a very clear gap that could be filled by a government program is that something that you can also assist with absolutely that that's a that's a core piece of our emerging vision here is that through the grant program and and the collective action piece of our work we hope that threads will emerge that we can then take to the government um, as a as a you know a strong coalition of partners to say you know what um, there there's a serious issue around you know I I'm just gonna you know pull something out like let's say alcohol that um, you know these 15 organizations have identified in Prince Edward Island as a core issue that that they want to approach and 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 revisit you know sort of resourcing and 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 how we're we're tackling this in the province i've experienced that at the national level where um, in my you know decade of work at the canadian center on substance abuse where prior to our establishment of the national framework for action in in the mid um, sort of around 2005 Health Canada was just sending money out to sort of all, all kinds of, of different initiatives across the country. The field said, no, we, we want to establish what our priorities are. We want to work together and we want to present those to the federal government and we want all funds to be directed towards these priorities. And because those set of priorities were established by the field, for the field, they're actually still guiding the work of the field today. Some, you know, 12 or 15 years later. And so that that's the hope and that's the vision here is that we can start to work collectively as, as a strong community voice and give the government clear direction. I mean, they're, they're doing the absolute best that they can right now. And, um, and they're asking for this. So, so that's a, that's, that's a big piece of our work in the years to come. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, and just this, my final question, I know I ask uncomfortable questions and I think that that's fair because, you know, we need to ensure the money that our government is spending in areas are going to see the most progress for every dollar that's spent. And we know mental health and addictions has been severely underfunded um, and Islanders are feeling the impacts of it every single day and a broader spectrum of people are feeling the impacts of it every day. And I had an interesting conversation with somebody um, earlier this week and we were talking about leadership. And if leaders continuously ask the same people, the same stakeholders, the same questions, they're gonna get the same solutions and they're just gonna keep implementing the same thing over and over and over again. And we can see where that's gotten us. And one of the areas that I see is extremely under consulted, and we've heard that from the minister who doesn't consult with unions on different um, legislation, for instance, they, like they will consult with colleges, but not actually with the unions. So frontline workers are absolutely the people who are dealing with this every single day. And I recognize going out to the not-for-profits and talking to them and, and, and uh, um, harvesting money, the information from them is important. 
But I really think that we would severely be missing the boat if we're not actually talking to frontline healthcare workers, frontline social development and housing um, employees, um, child protection um, caseworkers, different areas like that <coughs> that are working in this every single day but are being silenced in their organization and they're not allowed to talk outside of that. And if your arm's length, is there a way that you can dig into that information so that you can start harvesting information from the frontline workers that are seeing it every single day and are experiencing just as much mental health, stress, anxiety, and everything because they're being silenced and can't actually speak out for what they're experiencing every day. Is that, I'm gonna leave that dead cat on the table for you <laughs> and say, I really think that that's another place that if somebody arm's length can go in and provide security and safety to um, public sector employees that are dealing with these things every single day, that that might be a really interesting place to start looking for where we're missing upstream because they see it every single day but often can't speak out about it. Can I make a comment about that, Chair? Yep. Chair, can I make a comment about that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, uh, sorry. Um, excellent point, uh, Michelle. Um, I have a, uh, uh, one, of my, my, one of my children, my, uh, my middle daughter is an early childhood caregiver um, who has her, everybody in her organization where she works and all her colleagues and peers across the island have experienced a uh, you know extreme amount of stress like other islanders have during during COVID. Um, I agree with you 100%. Um, they're islanders. They're part of our community, um, and they will be on the list. It's just not NGOs. We have got to talk to the people that are in the trenches every day. They're our neighbors. They're our friends. Uh, they're our family members. So, thank you for that point. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Michelle. Uh, just, uh, just uh, I have a, a few questions here at the end, and um, just want to thank you both for taking on the challenge of coming into the space. I think um, it's, it's been an inc incredibly difficult couple of years uh, on the island, and um, we, we need you to do a good job with this, and I know that, I know that you will. Um, I look at it, um, undoubtedly, this has been very difficult on Islanders, um, and you talk about upstream and and, uh, and proactive approaches. Well, I look at I look at the the, the mental health along with wellness um, as being very proactive. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Heather Morrison is the chief public health officer, but she also has a responsibility to look at wellness in Prince Edward Island. Um, but she's she's been very busy with with uh, pandemic. Um, how does wellness, how does people's wellness activity, um, you know, how do we come together to, to, to make sure that Islanders know that it's important for self-care, it's important for them to be active and, and, um, and moving their bodies in this incredibly difficult time? I, I think that's a really, really good point to emphasize because it, it, it's a core part of, of that vision we have of that that whole of island sort of a sense of well-being you know way way down the road and um you know what one way that that islanders will will be able to be exposed to that is hopefully through the projects that that come out of the grant program but i know that um a lot of the discussions that i participate in with with members from CPHO and 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 other other members of departments in in the government, they, they speak to this at great length and and are hoping that the alliance will, will take on a role where we we work to demonstrate to Islanders what does wellness and well being look like and and that could be through you know that robust communications approach that I that I mentioned in the presentation. So that's sort of creating opportunities for Islanders to experience wellness and, and help them to find ways to incorporate that in, into their day. Because I think COVID and, and other things have, have sort of caused people um, uh, the, the situation where, where they've lost touch with, with what that looks like and maybe they never had it. I, I know myself as a, you know, a busy working mom with two children that I've been homeschooling off and on quite a bit in, in the last two years uh, in my time at, up in Ottawa as well. 
I, I certainly lost touch with, with my own wellness and, and personal activities. And so it's something I'm quite seized with. And we're looking for ideas from the community. And um, that, that, that's a big part of where we want to invest our resources and time in the future is, is those, those simple activities that, that don't cost a lot of money, but people just need, need access to, um, you know, just like using our island trail system is a great example of something that I think is extremely underutilized. And, and that's something that through a partnership with, with a lot of the organizations that already care about that, um, we could we could work to to further emphasize. Great, thanks, Karen. Mr. Chair, on a on a lighter note, um, which you know uh, I guess emphasizes your uh, your example. Uh, Karen challenged me to uh, an activity thing um, a, a week ago, and it ends today. And I just wanted to mention publicly that I crushed her. So um, you know, so that's what that's what it's all about. To you know, starts there with individuals and challenging each other, each other, motivating each other. And I know I don't have to tell you about that. Great. Well, congratulations on your victory. Um, <laughs> I <don't> think so. <laughs> um, I just want to, when, when you, when you uh, a couple, I'm going to just jump for, I think I'll wrap this up for fairly, very soon. Um, but your new program, um, and I saw your timelines where there's something in January, uh, it comes out in February and the money, the money goes out in, in March. But I, I think that the, it's such a new program. Um, is there, is there room if, if organizations, important organizations miss that deadline? I mean, uh, March comes, money's gone. Is that, then they have to wait for the next year, but there's so many, different things i'm just asking the organization like people might not even catch on to this um for the next few months are, are you guys holding back some funding for projects that 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 come to you sporadically that you believe in that need to be funded so i i wouldn't per se be able to to suggest that we're holding back funds um and we we haven't considered that yet we're, we're really hoping that uh, organizations come forward with enough robust proposals that we're, we're able to to share the two million dollars immediately in March. But that said, the, the next uh, the, the next launch of the grant program will be as soon as May in in 2022. So uh, I think what you're saying speaks so much, Gord, to how we're looking at this because we're expecting that there are a lot of organizations where this is going to be a bit of an organic process. They're going to start to understand what we're doing. They're going to start to pay attention to this, this language about well-being and, and the workshops that we're doing and the work. And we're hoping that, that their ideas will evolve and, and, and the concepts for multi-sectoral partnerships will evolve out of some of the network that we're creating. So if not now, we're hoping, you know, in, in May, people can get involved. We're going to have a, a provincial conference in, in the summer, COVID permitting, where we want to bring together all interested partnership, or, or, sorry, inter, interested partners to do a, a huge knowledge mob, mobilization process so they can learn from the, the projects that are underway. Other well-being initiatives uh, being undertaken in the region and the province and that will hopefully inspire uh, a new tranche of work in the fall for that that following uh, grant launch in in December of 2022. Great, great. Um, just two more questions. Uh, the community-based peer review. Um, I like that. The board setting up the board community-based peer review. Um, it's such a small community. Um, so how do you, how can you get the best people to peer review the best people on your board and give the money to the best organizations that are probably doing, uh, 16 different jobs in the same field? How are you, how are you going to, um, navigate that? Well, we've been quite seized with this because, you know, as we all know, we, we have a limited population here and, and there's a lot of people working in this domain where there deep sort of conflict of interest and, and that kind of thing. So, we, we have a, a strong matrix that we're going to be using to, to select the peer committee members and, and, and obviously along with, with the applications. 
we are expanding our reach beyond the province for participants in the peer review committee, just for that very reason that while we want um, to have a large number of islanders involved in, in the peer committee, we want to have um, some voices from outside the province that can bring perspectives from other jurisdictions who are also um, more than likely removed from the potential conflicts of interests that, that those of us islanders experience just by the sheer fact that, that we are a, a, a small little ecosystem here. So we're conscientious of that. That's my point. Okay, perfect. Well, maybe we'll, we'll explore that in future meetings too. Um, and the sure. last question I have is um, you did mention you did mention um, inequality, equity, mental health and well-being, poverty, LGBTQ, Indigenous, and, and obviously the BIPOC communities would be involved in that as well. Um, but I don't see it in your funding stream. Would that be something that you might look for a funding stream in the future? Um, and those organizations are, don't have the, the mental health and wellness experts at this time. In there, would you consider uh, HR funding for those organizations, and how do you uh, uh, expect to explore those those avenues um, with those important organizations in the future? So this has certainly come up, uh, notably in in the Indigenous realm of, of things, because that we, you know we've been we've been looking at how other grant programs are are um, organized, you know, sort of similar types of grant programs in other regions and and sometimes they, they have like an indigenous stream or um, certain streams like that. We really wanted to spend more time speaking directly with these communities before we established something like that. So this is something that you could potentially see in the future. We just wanted to do it with the community rather than just like throwing a stream there, let's say, and, and putting pressure on a community right now that potentially doesn't have the capacity um, to prioritize this at the current moment. You know, there, there could be other initiatives. So I, I would say that that's certainly a, an iterative process that we want to, to work with the community to develop. Great. But we're, we're aware of it for sure. Great. Thank you very much. I make a comment, Chair? Sure, John. Um, so that's a great point. So say we have organizations like, uh, you know, uh, that come out of the BIPOC community, or other smaller um, uh, not-for-profit organizations, and it is determined through our, our meetings and so on that there is a there is a real need for HR. It's not unusual, even in the business world, that small businesses uh, share a, a CFO. Um, so I could really see that maybe uh, facilitated um, by the uh, by the alliance that there could be an HR resource. Uh, for organizations like that, again, and, and maybe it is uh, financial as, as well, uh, accounting, accounting services. So I think it's a great point, and we have to be flexible and change and, and, and see where our resources are directed as the needs come up in the community. Just want to really thank you um, for for coming on today. You asked, uh, you answered a lot of great questions, and um, uh, thank you, thank you for your time today. And and I guess it brings mean new meaning to. I hope you're keeping well, um, and that's the that's the name of things. And uh, good luck, and I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, in the in the future. So, um, so I'll just uh, I'll sign off and uh, let John get back to bed here. Thank you so much yeah. for your time today. Thank you. My grandson's screaming on the other side, so I've, I've got another job to go to. <laughs> good, good stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Karen and John. Great. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Great. Perfect. Bye -bye. Thank you. We'll just make sure the mics are shut off, and um, then we'll just uh, keep going with the, the rest of the meeting at this time. Um, can Carla, Carla hear everything? It's important. Yeah. Hola. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, uh, number four on our list is uh, any new business at this time? No. Perfect. Um, uh, sure, Zach? Did we get an update back from the letter that we sent to Hockey PEI? I don't know. Or what was the fee what was the feedback on that? Yeah, uh, I'll pass it over to the clerk because we've been in touch. She's been in touch. been in touch with Hockey PEI. Um, so the letter was requesting them to attend a briefing after the investigation. So I'm still waiting on an update on when that might be. Okay. Thanks. Um, great. Uh, Sydney? Sorry, can you explain that again? So you've been in contact with them? And you're waiting for them 
to give us a time? Uh, yes, so based on when the investigation is complete, I'm waiting to hear back from them. I, the last time I spoke to them, it would be within this week, potentially next week on that update. Sydney? Thank you. What, uh, what does the what does the committee uh, think about waiting until that investigation or asking them to come in uh, sooner based on, on recent events? Do we want to wait until that investigation is done? Yeah. Just throwing it out there. Is that an appropriate us. timeline? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Zach? Yeah, I know I do agree with Robert on that as well. I think wait until the investigation. That's my take on it. Yeah. And I would just add, I would, I'm under the impression that the investigation is late at this point. Um, so I, I, I was informed that it, it should have been done over the Christmas break. That's the information that I received. So um, at this point, it is, it is tardy. Um, so I don't know if, but if the committee wishes to wait, then. But yeah, Michelle. So I would like to know when the investigation will be done and if it's going to be a long timeline um, in order to turn that around. Like to your point, Gord, if it was supposed to be done over the Christmas holidays and that's delayed, um, I'd like to have that information because um, I do think that having that, having a report on that original instance is important. Um, to at least have when they come to appear. But I also think that this is something that's timely and that we should be looking at having them come in as soon as possible. So I'd like to understand what would be that timeline to get the investigation and how much are they leaning on the third party to get the investigation completed, I guess, yes. would be a question I'd have. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, but they have agreed to come in. And they're just waiting for for that to to complete. Um, do you even want to speak to Michelle's comments? Yeah, Rob. I guess everything. So I mean, uh, you know, we're only a few days past Christmas holidays, technically. <laughs> so, uh, but maybe if they could give us an update on when they expect the report to be uh, completed and uh, presented, uh, then then. Uh, said if, if they're talking another couple of months well that's the whole different story than if it's just another couple of weeks right mm -hmm. and with the committee obviously I'm maybe getting a sense that the committee would like to prioritize that as soon as possible if, if, if that's some of our messaging yeah perfect uh, anybody yeah okay mm -hmm. perfect so we'll send send set we'll get you, uh, get the clerk to uh, correspond with them and uh, ask for a uh, when that day would, and and ask them to be ready for a prioritization to come into this committee. Um, and any other new business? Um, so, can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, Zach Bell. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.